Matt here from MyRawIntuition.com. Today we are going live with uh, somebody that I have a lot of respect for and that I have learned a lot from over the last 10 years that I've been living a raw vegan lifestyle. His name is Lauren Lockman. I'm sure you guys are well familiar with Lauren. Um, he runs uh, Tanglewood Wellness Center down in Costa Rica. Uh, a retreat center that I personally have been interested in visiting. So eventually I may end up doing that. We will see, but uh, I've heard a lot of good things. And so, yeah, I wanted to bring Lauren on to talk to me about a topic that I'm actually not that uh, well versed in, and that is farming or, you know, permaculture specifically. So I'm going to talk to Lauren about the food forest that they are, you know, building and growing down in Costa Rica um, and uh, permaculture and everything that is involved with that, uh, because I have seen quite a bit of talk uh, on the Internet about how animal agriculture, well, how plant agriculture does not kill, uh, no, animal Plant agriculture kills more animals than animal agriculture. That's what they're saying, all right? So I wanted to talk to somebody that is actually growing food and you know implementing these systems and get their perspective on if this is accurate because I know that it's not accurate, but I want to hear it from somebody that's actually doing the work, all right? And so, yeah, we're going to talk to Lauren about his experience um, as I believe he is a permaculture, uh, certified permaculture instructor. And so, uh, yeah, he would be a perfect person to give us an idea of, you know, what goes into, you know, growing food and especially, you know, fruits. I think fruits are um, one of the best crops or, you know, items that we can grow and have the least amount of impact negative impact on the environment around us. All right, so that is what we are going to be talking about today. I see Lauren is here. Let me just see if I can invite him in. We will get started. If you guys have any questions, of course, as always, leave them down in the comments box below. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, if you have any questions about, you know, growing food or, you know, permaculture or uh, Lawrence Retreat Center, um, you know, all these things, uh, just leave them down in the comments box and we'll try to get to those. All right. Well, thank you everybody for being here. I appreciate everybody showing up on this Monday afternoon. Um, it has been a good weekend, so I hope everybody is going to have a great week. All right. Um, I, I think I invited Lauren here. Let's see. Try that again. All right. Oh. Looks like uh, it's saying Lauren is unable to join. Uh, Lauren, I'm not sure... I don't know if you're on a computer, maybe. Are you on a computer? That, that happened actually yesterday with Dr. Tuttle. Um, if, you, if you're on a computer, it's not going to work. So we would have to do it on your phone. But, you know, I, I know you're on Instagram already, so you might already know that. Yeah, so um, just... Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you're on your phone or if you're on your computer, but if you're on a computer, try the phone and that should allow you to join. Hey, Annie, uh, thanks for being here. What's up, everybody else? We're just trying to get Lauren joined on the live here. We're going to talk about some permaculture. We're going to talk about veganism. We're going to talk about health and, you know, all these things. But specifically, I'm curious to hear Lauren's take on how permaculture and and i'm not sure if he considers um you know what he's doing veganic growing but i want to hear if he has any insights and um information about veganic growing and if that is a sustainable practice 
Um, I've, I've seen people say that it's not a sustainable way to grow food. So I've um, been doing a little bit of research on that, and but I'm sure Lauren has more information. Um, so that would be great to hear from him. All right, I think, I think he's almost here. Hey, there he is. How, how are you, Lauren? I'm good, man. How about you? I'm great. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, sorry. I, I did not know I could do it from my laptop. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why it doesn't allow people to join from their computer, but yeah. yeah. So anyways, yeah, great to see you. I good to see you really, too, man. Thank you. I appreciate, uh, you know, everything that you do and, you know, all the information that you put out for people. Um, I've been learning from you for over a decade now. And I've just always appreciated, you know, your availability and just the information that you freely put out there. So well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, no, I'm happy to do it. So and I understand you're interested in talking about uh, how permaculture um, perhaps contrasts with regular uh, agriculture. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see these people out there saying that, uh, you know, plant agriculture and growing, you know, plant foods are more harmful in terms of crop deaths and, and killing animals than animal agriculture. And, you know, something about that doesn't seem right to me. So I figured yeah. I'd reach out to somebody like yourself who is actually growing food and, and has some experience in that. Right, right. Yeah. Well, let, let's, I mean, you know, it's, it's an interesting point. And the, the truth is that regular agriculture, even growing organic produce, does, can, in fact, uh, kill many animals. Um, and this is through plowing the soil, through tilling the soil. Uh, you know, anything that uses machinery tends to leave dead animals behind. Sure. The greatest number of deaths, though, happen as a result of poisons whether we're talking about birds or we're talking about fish, um, or we're talking about, uh, you know, even small mammals, it's, it's usually it's the, the greatest number of deaths, as I understand. And, and first of all, I should say, mm -hmm. I've done some research, but there's not mm -hmm. a lot of great information. There's, there's, mm -hmm. uh, there's a few papers on this, uh, but not tons of studies that have actually looked at. And, and you know, it's, it's impossible to count all the animals. So what right. they're doing is they're, they're looking at small areas, trying to, to get a sense of what happens. And then, look, you know, taking those numbers and saying, well, this is what it would be if we looked at a larger scale, that that may not always be completely accurate. So any numbers that I or anybody else can quote, they're going to be estimates at best. The estimates, the estimates are still in favor of veganic agriculture as opposed to growing animal products. If you look at animal products, I mean, just in the US alone, there are roughly 9.2 billion animals killed for food every year. Okay, in fact, that doesn't include fish. That's just pigs, cattle, and chickens. Roughly 9.2 billion per year. There's roughly 7.3 billion animals killed per year. It's estimated in, we'll call it con conventional plant agriculture. So if you're growing crops, um, you're gonna kill, you're gonna kill over 7 billion animals. So they say across, across the entire uh, continent, North America. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're both huge numbers. It's, it's kind of incomprehensible. Yeah. What's what's happening now? Needless to say, or maybe it's not needless to say, um, permaculture has never really been used on a large scale. Permaculture tends to be rather small holdings. My yeah. guess is the average is probably between one and five acres only. I mean, it's possible to do much more than that, mm -hmm. but that's not what most people are doing. Most people are taking relatively small farms and growing food for themselves or for a very small community. And one of the things that's very interesting to, to point out about permaculture is that, first of all, maybe I should start by saying that, as you may be aware, permaculture, the term, is really the marriage of permanent and agriculture. That was the original idea. 
Okay. Now, years later, the founders said, well, it's also permanent and culture because it's more than just agriculture. It's really about how we use land in every way. But when we talk about growing food with permaculture techniques, you know, we're really talking about permanent agriculture. And the idea there is that unlike almost any, I mean, there are no-till ways of growing food that aren't permaculture, but with most types of agriculture, whether you're using machines or it's all hand done, and, and anything hand done is gonna be far fewer deaths, obviously, right, if that's the primary concern. Um, but with permaculture, whether you, some, some larger farms, some larger installations do actually use machines to dig swales. For instance, we've never done that. We've done everything here by hand. You know, I'm, I'm in Costa Rica now, I was in Panama for six years early. I'm now 17, coming up on 17 and a half years in Central America growing food. And uh, we grow quite a bit of it. We have more than 200 varieties of fruit growing on site. We've got thousands of trees planted here on 35, uh, 37 acres so far. Wow. And um, we, because labor is relatively inexpensive, we've done everything by hand. When we're, when we're doing a project, you know, typically between May and July every year, if we can, we'll plant as many trees as possible because we want to make sure that you, normally it starts raining again in May. And so we want to make sure that we're planting early in the rainy season so trees have as many months of rain as possible to get a good strong uh, foundation before we go into a five month hard dry season where there's almost no water whatsoever. Hmm. Uh, we can theoretically, we can sustain plants and trees through the dry season, but it's a lot harder when it's not raining at all. Sure. And so, so we, want, we want to give everything a good head start. So typically in over, you know, a course of eight to 12 weeks, we may bring, bring in an extra 10 guys, depending on how many trees we're trying to plant and how much area we're trying to cover, how many swales we're trying to build, but we do it all by hand. And when we do it by hand, there are probably, I mean, somewhere between zero, you know, and a tiny fraction of the number of animals killed that are happening any other way. It may, it may be that there are times where it's impossible to avoid. Yeah. Acc accidentally, it may happen. You know, if you're sticking shovels into the soil to dig a hole, you, you might wind up beheading some rodent that lives there without even knowing it, you know, with no intention of doing so. Yeah. It may be that it's impossible. I, you know, it's, you may be aware there are people on the planet, there's one religion in particular, where they sweep the ground in front of them when they walk outside so they don't accidentally kill an insect by stepping on it. Wow. Um, I have no intent, you know, I, I do my best yeah, I don't kill anything on purpose. Yeah. And, but I'm not too concerned if I step on an ant. Sure. I can't, you know, I can't live my life worrying too much about that. Yeah. When I'm spending a lot of time outside where, you know, here in the tropics, they say that the mass of the ants is greater than the mass of all the other animal species put together. Wow. So there's a lot of ants around. <laughs> um, can't really worry too much about that. But, you know, there, there's, there's no question there, there's a vast number of animals killed with conventional agricultural practices. With permaculture, we build the swales, which, um, you know, for anyone who's not familiar with this, a swale is essentially a ditch. And unlike, you know, a stream is always going downhill. So water is always running. And eventually all streams run into lakes or ponds or seas or oceans. I mean, eventually all the water makes its way to the ocean one way or the other. Um, Swales, the intention is that every point is at the same elevation. So water doesn't run at all. I mean, it runs into the swale. Hmm. You know, no, no land, uh, theoretically, no land is perfectly flat. There may be some places, but typically there's always going to be some grain. So here in Costa Rica, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with Costa Rica, if you've been here, but where no. we live, there's, there's virtually no flat land. We created a field. So we could toss a Frisbee or kick a soccer ball or something. But for the most part, you know, that we're up in the mountains and it can be, it can be pretty, pretty rough uh, terrain. And so when rain hits the ground, within about three minutes, 95% of the water is in the stream at the bottom and it's running away. It's running off the property. And what we want to do is we want to keep the water on the property. 
one of the one of the most significant aspects of permaculture is water management, especially in a place where we have a five month hard dry season. Yeah. You know, if, if you're if you're in Costa Rica and you're on the Caribbean side, uh, here we have a wet season and a dry season. There they have a wet season and a wetter season. Um, that they, they get sixty percent more rain than we do. We get a lot of rain. They get sixty percent more rain. And wow. so if you're there and there really are no significant uh, periods of time where there's no rain, it's much less of an issue. It's a lot easier. You can stick almost anything in the ground as long as it's for that climate. It's probably going to be fine. But here we, we do have to figure out how to ensure that plants that we're, that we're trying to grow are going to be okay during this five month season. And so a swale is one way to do that. The water runs into the swale because all the points are at the same elevation. Theoretically, it doesn't run. It just sits there. It seeps into the ground over time. And on the downhill side of it, we plant a bunch of fruit trees. And then we'll plant ground covers and we'll plant nitrogen fixing plants as well. But uh, the point of all of this is that with permaculture, once you build it, there's relatively little work to it. And that's why they call it permanent agriculture. It's, it's not like conventional agriculture where you constantly have to do the same things over and over again. I mean, initially we have to do a little bit of weeding. Mm -hmm. Once ground covers are well established, there's not so much of that that's necessary. Yep. And so, you know, aside from pruning, I mean, the, the biggest job once things are going is actually harvesting the food. Hmm. And, and honestly, this kills almost nothing. And I, I basically, I briefly noticed a comment here. I'm not sure if I can even pull it up now. Let's see here. About killing insects intentionally, how to handle mosquitoes, not letting you fall asleep at night. Um, is it okay if I answer that question, Matt? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, you know, th this is an interesting thing that a lot of people may not be aware of, but uh, mosquitoes and other biting insects are typically more attracted to you when your body's detoxing. And the way most people eat, the body's detoxing all the time. It may not be discernible because they just feel the way they feel. But if you're eating conventional stuff the way most people do, the body is constantly detoxing. And that actually attracts mosquitoes and other insects. So... I'm sitting right now, when I first moved into this space uh, nine and a half years ago, there was just a hole in the wall here. Now, there's, there's a bigger hole now. We, we opened it up, but there's also screen and windows that I can close, uh, jealousy windows, you know, the series of pieces of glass that move up and down. Um, when I got here, it was just a hole in the wall. And it was, it was completely open to, to where my bed was. And they never bothered me. We have mosquito nets. We have screens on all the windows. We have screen doors on our guest rooms. And we have mosquito nets over the beds. Mm. We don't have a lot of mosquitoes. But because our clients here are detoxifying, they, they do attract mosquitoes. And I sometimes forget. I mean, I'll have people that today, someone said, uh, every day I'm consulting with the people fasting with me. And someone said, um, you know, I got a bunch of mosquito bites. I'm like, oh, right. I forget there's mosquitoes. I haven't seen one. I, and now I don't know how I don't notice them because they leave me alone completely. And they leave me alone because my body's no longer detoxing to any significant degree. Um, once, so to come back to your question, fruity healing, um, how do you deal with mosquitoes not letting you fall asleep at night? Uh, why don't you let me guide you through a process so you get your body clean and then they won't bother you anymore. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's what happens for me. We just, it's just not an issue. We don't have to think about that. So with, with permaculture, we can take it down from the, I'm trying to remember what the numbers are per acre, um, because they, they look at this different ways. Uh, but, but the numbers are, you know, are significant. And I, I mean, I, it's, it's, again, it's really kind of mind blowing when you first look at these numbers and you see how many animals die as a result of agriculture. Yeah. And, you know, it's an interesting thing because we, we think, I think we were taught, or I was, that, you know, we, we became civilized and we began growing our own food. And that was a positive thing. And some people would argue that this is actually how we sort of enslaved ourselves. Um, you know, it's a lot of work, the way most people grow food. And a lot of people, like locally, a lot of the, the locals here eke a living out of the land. They're not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. They're able to make, you know, to, to, to get their needs met, but, but just barely. And it's a lot of work. 
Mm. And, and permaculture, it's a technology that most people aren't aware of, but not only can we avoid um, killing most of the animals, I mean, there's no poisons whatsoever. Now, but by the way, I mean, you, again, I'm sure you're aware of this. Organically grown food can use pesticides. The difference is that they're not petroleum based pesticides, which can have very, very long half lives, which means take a long time to break down. Um, they found Roundup in polar ice, right? You know, fully, fully intact, just as toxic as ever. And it could be there for a long, long time. Yeah. Organic pesticides, which are legally used in organic crops, are, are things that are derived from plants, from, from organic materials, and they break down quickly. And so, and I'll give you an example. We, you know, people say, well, don't you, don't you have to kill insects to protect your crops? We don't. We don't endeavor to kill anything. Um, but for instance, there's a wasp that lays its eggs on papayas here. And the larvae hatch and they crawl inside and what it, it does something to the fruit. The fruits fall off the plants, immature. They, they never mature. We, we wind up losing all the crops. Mm -hmm. we, we protect them by spraying the fruits every week as we're growing them with, I, I guess, what could be called a pesticide because its intention is to avoid the pest, the wasp. And it's, the only, it's only this one insect in this case. But it's a concoction we make ourselves with hot peppers and garlic and things like that. Yes. And it's just a liquid that we put in a spray bottle and we spray the things and it's not killing anything. It, but the insects, which are apparently smarter than most people, uh, come around this smelly stuff and say, we, I don't want any part of that. And they just leave them alone. It's not, we're not trying to kill them. We're just trying to get them to leave the food alone. And it works really well. Um, there's other ways, you know, with, with permaculture, you can use companion planting. Uh, the easiest example, I'll, you may have heard me talk about this before because I've been talking about this for years. But when I first moved to Central America 17 and a half years ago, one of my first friends was an organic farmer in Panama. Hmm. And he struggled to feed his family. Uh, people around where he was weren't interested in paying more money for organic produce. And so, and he had a big family he was trying to feed. And this guy was an unbelievable wealth of knowledge. So I thought, you know, I've got a team of gardeners that don't know a fraction of what this guy knows. Maybe I'll, I can see if I can hire him to come. And so every month for a while, he would uh, take the bus. He lived about an hour and a half away. He would take the bus to where we were. I would pick him up the bus stop and drive him to, to my place. And he would work all day alongside my team, my gardeners, teaching them how to do what we were doing as well as possible. And then uh, he and I would have lunch together. We would have dinner together. He would spend the night. He'd work in the morning at midday. I would drive him back to the bus and he'd go home. And I could pay him. We were getting the, you know, the benefit of his knowledge and he was able to generate some income. But I remember the very first time he was there, he said, you've got tomatoes here. You should plant basil here. And I said, I don't eat basil. He said, no, it's not for you, it's for the tomatoes. I said, I'm pretty sure the tomatoes don't eat basil either. And he said, the wind comes up the mountain in the dry season, there's an inversion, the wind comes up. And if you plant basil here with the tomatoes here, the wind will blow the smell of the basil over the tomatoes and the insects will leave the tomatoes alone. And so you know, these are some of the kinds of techniques that we use to protect our food without any poison whatsoever. And again, you know, this is important if you're just tuning in because the vast majority of deaths caused, estimated to be caused from agriculture are caused because of pesticides, because of poisons, pesticides and, and chemical fertilizers, which are often just as toxic. Um, it's these toxic substances that farmers are, are using, uh, you know, in, by, by, I don't even know, hundreds of tons, maybe probably thousands of tons per year, which are actually doing the most damage. Of course, again, there's animals that are killed by tractors and other machines, but uh, it's the poisons that are the biggest part. So just eliminating the poisons means you're dramatically reducing deaths if you go to organic. And if you go from, from normal organic or veganic to permaculture-based practices, 
all of a sudden it goes down to nearly zero. Okay. The other thing I think that's important, and I, I mean, this, this is just an opinion, but I mean, it's hard to say that these animals have more value than these. Um, but what, you know, when we're talking about cows and pigs, I mean, there's roughly, see, I think it's 160 million cows and pigs killed per year in, in North America or in the US, 160 million per year. Um, and something like 9 billion chickens per year, which is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think it may be true for chickens. I've never really known very many chickens personally, but uh, cows and pigs, I actually have known. And these are animals that have personalities and have, have emotions and, you know, they feel the loss of their child when the baby's born and it's taken away from them. Mm -hmm. um, and these, you know, these are animals that are, that are being killed so that people can enjoy a hamburger or a piece of bacon. Um, when obviously you and I are both clear, I think that this is completely unnecessary. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, I mean, I, I understand. I, I don't, I don't know as much about your history, but I'm, I'm guessing that perhaps it was not so dissimilar from mine. I, I first set on this path because I wanted to get my health back, having lost it in my early 20s. And it, it was actually a bit of a surprise when I learned that I didn't need to eat animal products to be healthy. Because I'd grown up being taught that I needed to eat eggs and dairy products and meat in order to, to, to help my own body be healthy. When I realized that I not only didn't need it, but that I was actually healthier with that, I mean, j just realizing I didn't need it. My very next thought was, if I don't have to eat these things, what gives me the right to cause suffering or death to another species? I, I don't understand how we have the right to do that. Right. And so I thought, okay, you know, I, I, no matter what, what I might desire, and I, the truth is, it was really easy for me to give up meat. That was the easiest thing. My body definitely did not want it. <laughs> um, dairy products are highly addictive, and giving up cheese was much harder, and you know other things. But uh, I thought, you know, no matter what, I'm not going to eat these things because I don't want to be responsible for the the death or suffering of other sentient beings. We don't really have the right to do that. So I think it's clear that with permaculture techniques, I mean, you know, basically what we do here is we plant trees. We have a far, fairly, I mean, I guess it's not so small. We have a, we have a greenhouse. Um, it could be done with plastic sheeting or with hard plastic roofing. But the idea is to grow things like lettuce and tomatoes, uh, large tomatoes, don't handle all the rain we get. We want to grow them year round. And they, they're, they're not happy if there's too much rain. Both the melons, we also grow melons, uh, but the melons and tomatoes will literally explode if, they, if there's too much water. They'll just keep on getting bigger until they explode. And so what we do is we grow them under plastic so that we can control how much water they get. And uh, by the way, I mean, that's that's, it's controversial whether that's really ideal or not. Some people would say, well, permaculture, you know, it's about working with the land and maybe you should be growing things that don't need plastic. Um, mm -hmm. That's one way to look at it. You know, I'm willing to make compromises because to have, to, to be able to grow the things we like. And, yeah. uh, you know, for anyone that's, that's not aware of it, it's estimated that roughly, if you look at the, the energy embedded in food, there can be quite a bit of it. Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, about a third of it is in the growing of the food, the way food is grown. You know, again, conventional agriculture, there's a lot of energy embedded in running tractors and combines and all these things. Um, a third of it roughly is in transportation, right? Food is, is you know, is moved um, from California, uh, that part of the, the U.S., all across North America, both mm -hmm. across the U.S. and Canada. A lot of it's coming from the same corner of, of uh, the US. And that means it's, you know, it's going on trucks and maybe in trains. Um, 
in some cases, many thousands of miles. I grew up outside of Washington, D.C., and the vast majority of what we ate, I'm just going to let the cat out, uh, the vast majority of what we ate there um, was coming from, from a long way off. Okay, and so there's a lot of energy there. And roughly a third of it, uh, of the energy embedded in food, is in the cooking and preparation of the food, processing, etc. So here, where what we're endeavoring to do, and we're not, we're not quite there yet, um, but the goal, which I think we'll achieve before too long, is to grow the vast majority of our own food, which means, um, you know, there's no machines involved. Again, we've got, we've got labor involved, but that's a little different because we're, we know what we're talking about with the energy embedded in food is the use of fossil fuels, which are limited, right? And, and precious running out. Um, here we, we use no fossil fuels to, to grow food, zero. Um, we have no transportation costs to get the food to us. We, someone goes and picks it and walks it up to the building. I mean, someone's getting exercise moving our food from where it's grown to where we're eating it. And that's probably a good thing for that person. And sure. there's no energy embedded in cooking food because we don't have any means of cooking food here. There's no oven, there's no stove, there's no grill, there's nothing. Um, now, there, there's some things may eventually wind up in a blender or a juicer, I suppose, but, but it's a fraction. So you know, we're literally talking about a fraction of the energy use to grow food the way we eat it. Um, and we're talking, you know, coming back to the original subject, we're talking about a, a tiny, tiny fraction of the number of animals that have to give their lives so that humans can eat. I, I, I'm not so sure that conventional agriculture really makes any sense. Uh, right. I don't think it does. Anyway, I feel like I've been talking, babbling on. You must have questions. Yeah. No, I, I loved it. Um, yeah, so so one thing that you said was that most people that are doing permaculture are typically doing like one to five acres. Uh, is that right? So yeah, um, I mean, there, obviously, there are some larger installations as well. But but for the most yeah. part, they're relatively small holdings where people are growing food for themselves. Right. So um, do you do you have like an estimate? Because I know it takes at least this is what I just researched um, for one it takes at least like three acres for one grass fed cow to, to raise a grass fed cow. They need at least three acres. Um, and that's just one cow, right? So how much right. food do you produce with three acres of land? If you're just growing, like say what you're growing there, how much, how much food are you producing? Oh, with I wish I had done, I wish I had gone and, and looked up some numbers for you. Uh, I didn't do that in advance, but I can tell you that, um, there is, there's no more efficient way to create calories than via fruit trees. So right. for instance, a mature mango tree will produce roughly a thousand mangoes in a season. Um, let's say the average mango is half a pound. That's 500 pounds. We can get something like, let me think about this. I think it's about 20 mango trees on, a, on an acre. Now, if I'm right about that, we're, we're looking at 10,000 pounds of mangoes mm. on an acre of land. You say it's three acres for one cow. Yeah. So we're looking at 30,000 pounds of mangoes compared to, I, you know, I have no idea how many pounds of beef, a beef cow, one beef cow produces. Right. But, but I'm guessing it's slightly less than 30,000. I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, you know, there's, there's no question. I mean, it's, it, it's crazy the differences in terms of how much more food we can, we can produce. In fact, the vast majority of acreage is used to grow animals. It's used, it's used for feed for animals. Um, let me see if I think I might actually have that number here somewhere. Um, but I, I believe it's, let me see here. No, I'll have to find it. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's dramatic how much, how much land is used just for that purpose. Yeah, I think it's close to like 70% of our usable land is. Uh, I, think you're, I think you're right. I think that's about the right number. And by the way, I just realized that I dramatically understated the effect here because what I told you is that um, 
animal deaths are roughly 20% greater. I didn't say that, but that's roughly what it works out to. Roughly 20% greater than the deaths caused by growing food crops on land, uh, plants. But because the vast majority of land is actually used to grow feed for animals, that land is causing just as many deaths as the land used to grow food for humans directly for plant foods. And right. so we have not only the 9.2, uh, roughly 9.2 billion animals killed every year directly, but we have billions more animals killed in the growing of the food to feed animals. And the only way that would be, you know, only, the only exception to that, only way you could say, well, I'm not part of that is someone eating animal products is if they're eating wild animals only that they're hunting themselves. Yeah. And, and by the way, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't, again, as I said earlier, I really don't believe that we have the right to kill anything. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not even the tiniest, I don't have one finger that's religious. Uh, I have no interest in religion personally. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. I consider myself spiritual and, you know, believe we're all connected and that life is precious. Yep. But the commandment says thou shalt not kill. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill people. So, how, you know, how, how, how it is anyone thinks we have the right to do this. I mean, and again, it, it, if we needed it to be healthy, it'd be different, but we clearly don't. The science is very, very clear about this. And so, yeah, I think, I think the bottom line is, uh, growing animal products is responsible for at least twice as many deaths as growing plants. And we can grow food using permaculture principles, which means we're talking about far, far fewer deaths altogether. And, and again, I mean, this, you know, so, some people are probably going to use certain substances to kill slugs. What I would intend uh, to do, attempt to do instead would be to use companion plants to try to avoid some of the pests. So we don't, we don't have to kill them at all. They can live. We just let them live somewhere else. Um, not, not where our food is growing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I got a stat here. It says in the U S over 70% of the grain of all grain that's produced is fed to farm animals. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody that's thinking right. that, um, you know, we're growing these corn fields and soy fields for human consumption it's, I think it's, it's, I think it's less than 10% of all of that is consumed by humans. So, um, yeah, the vast majority is going to raising the animals that uh, these people are consuming. Right. Um, well, you're talking direct, you're talking specifically about grains there. I just yeah. found the, the number I had been looking for earlier. According to um, United States Department of Agriculture data, 77, just over 77 million acres of, of land in the U.S. are used to grow food, grow crops that humans eat directly. 70, just over 77 million. 127 million acres are used to grow animal feed. Yeah. You know, and we're, 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 and we're not just talking about, because, I mean, again, really the, the question is way more complex than just counting how many dead animals there are. Yeah. Um, because growing, growing that pound of beef also uses a ridiculous amount of water. And right. water is a precious resource. There's not enough of it on the planet. Um, yeah. clean, clean water is, a, you know, is an issue. And so, uh, you know, a ridiculous amount of water. I, mean, I don't know if you've, um, yeah, well, it, it, The Colorado River runs uh, through that, you know, southwest corner of the U.S. and into Mexico. There is now almost no water arriving in Mexico. Mm. And that's because they are irrigating, they're taking that water to irrigate the desert so they can grow things like rice. Well, you know, absurd. Yeah. Which grows, grows in essentially in a pond. Um, they're growing this in the desert. You know they're they're using ridiculous amounts of water. Now that that may be direct for direct human consumption, but they're they're growing 
cattle all across the Southwest right. in places that don't really support it very well. Um, and again, there's going to be tons, uh, you know, many, many millions of deaths associated with this as well. So how, how anybody could justify this by any means, you know, the environmental impact of growing animal products is ridiculous. The health <laughs> impact is ridiculous. The energy impact. I mean, it's, it's, there's, re there's really no, no justification that I can come up with. And I think, you know, the, the truth about this is, is that when people choose to do something, they, they want to continue eating hamburgers and hot dogs. They're going to pay attention only to those things that support their choices. And they're right. going to ignore anything that doesn't. And that's because no one wants to be in cognitive dissonance. Yeah. yeah. And on top of everything that you just mentioned, um, the, the killing of predators of, you know, that the animal agriculture hires the government. Right to use our tax dollars to go out and, and kill millions of bears, deer, horses, uh, bobcats, uh, right. you know, raccoons, all, foxes, you know, all, all these different animals that you don't even it's, consider as being part of the equation, they're all being affected by this. It's, it's, a, it's a really, really good point. And remember the numbers I gave you earlier which were roughly 9.2 billion animals estimated, that's only cows, pigs, and chickens. Yeah. That doesn't include, uh, it doesn't include fish. It doesn't include other fowl. Um, you know, obviously that number, I mean, obviously those are the three biggest groups of animals that are eaten. Yeah. But there's, there's, there's got to be who knows how many billions more as well. Right. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty incredible once you start looking into it. Um, somebody asked, in, in permaculture, do you need to use uh, manure in growing or, or can you just use compost and things like that? Yeah, um, yeah yes, you can just use compost. We, we choose, I choose uh, not to use animal products at all. We don't use any manure. Okay. Um, I've had people recommend it and I, and I won't. I won't say that we never would use it because perhaps we will. I mean, animals are going to poop anyway. Right. Yep. We're not growing them for their poop. They're just pooping. And, you know, we, I, I mean, a lot of our neighbors here grow cattle. That's what they do. That's their business is raising cattle. Sure. We could probably get all the, all the cow manure we needed. Um, <laughs> there's enough people around here with horses. We could probably get all the horse manure we needed as well. Um, we, we choose not to use it because I'd, I'd really rather not be involved with it if possible. And because frankly, it smells bad. And I would rather, I'd rather not be dealing with that. Sure. Yeah, but no, I mean, we're, we're um, and I, I mean, I, I should hasten to add a couple things. I appreciate the, uh, the kind intro. I am indeed a certified permaculture instructor. Um, I'm not sure that makes me, you know, I'm pretty sure it doesn't make me the world's foremost expert on the subject. Um, lots of people have a certification and I'm probably like a lot of them in that I don't work in permaculture full time. Mm. Uh, as, as I'm sure you're aware, I'm, I'm a 31 year health coach, yeah. 26 and a half years running Tangle with the world's largest fasting center. Um, you know, we grow food here because we want the highest quality food and because there's nothing like stepping outside and picking it off your tree and eating it. Um, but it's not, it's not our full-time business. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I can't, I don't, I don't have time to focus on that. And so when we were starting to plan Las Cascadas, the, the big project that we're developing here, where there will be a huge nature preserve with the two highest waterfalls in Central America, at about 18 more waterfalls, there'll be a huge permaculture-based organic food farm. One of the, perhaps one of the largest permaculture installations in the world. Wow. Um, there will be a um, world-class botanical garden. There'll be a couple of intentional communities, including a raw vegan community and a vegan community. There'll be a cool commercial village where there'll be shops and boutiques and art galleries and so forth and so on. Um, and the goal for all of this is to, per, A, protect and preserve as much of the land as possible. So all the land 
except for the communities, which will be owned by community members. All the rest of the land will be owned by a 501c3 nonprofit foundation mm -hmm. set up in Boston, Massachusetts called Clean Source. Um, so that the land can be protected. Uh, there will be land leased to the various businesses on long-term leases, but the land will be owned by a nonprofit foundation to protect it. And the idea is to actually demonstrate what's possible, how we can live on the planet in ways that are actually not only not harmful, but also regenerative. I mm -hmm. know we've, we've, been, we've been talking about some of these ideas, but the fact is when we employ them, we wind up not destroying all the streams and rivers and lakes and ponds and oceans by putting pesticides into them, which, you know, when we talk about I me mean, coming back to that, I don't know that anyone is even capable of, of counting the aquatic deaths that occur as all this toxic garbage runs into the water. Yeah. You know, all these different bodies of water. Um, how do we even count those? I mean, it's just, again, it's going to be an estimate, but probably a pretty rough one. So, we, we use no, no poisons. Um, you know, we're talking about creating something that actually creates a healthy ecosystem. So not only are we not attempting to eliminate all the insect pests, but we're looking to create something that feed some of the, the other species that we want, right? I mean, we, we, want, we want a healthy ecosystem and that means we have birds and monkeys, et cetera, and some of them are gonna feed on some of these insects. So yes, yes, insects are gonna die um, to some degree, but that's what happens in nature. Um, yeah. You know, we're not, we're not doing anything that directly creates that outcome. Oh, I think, uh, can, you, can you still hear me? Did we lose? Are you still there? I'm still here. Yeah, I went to plug my cell phone in because I was losing, uh, getting close to battery. And I guess I must have um, maybe partially disconnected the cable. We don't have Wi-Fi here. Oh, okay. Uh, wi -Fi, people will hate to hear this, but Wi-Fi is harmful, so we don't use it. Everything's yeah. connected via Ethernet, and the adapter sometimes will just slip out a tiny bit. And... <laughs> I'm back. All right, cool. Um, somebody mentioned, uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, human poop, or I think they call it humanure? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I don't know if you really want to go there, man. That's a shitty <laughs> subject. Um, you know, we've, we, we've never directly used uh, humanure here. I know people who do and have. Mm. Uh, it's it's a valid way. I mean, you might as well use the material, I suppose. Uh, and we, we you know we, we use it, but in a different way. Um, we're because we're we're in a rural location. We're not connected to systems. There's no sewage system here. So yeah. instead, we have we have a series of septic tanks that we've built around the property, around the the land, and ultimately all the nutrients are going back into the soil mm. that way. But, but we're, we're doing it in such a way that they're filtering the soil in a more general way, not like we're putting it here for this particular crop. Okay. There is a way to do that, and there are various ways to do that. One way to do that would be to use composting toilets and then uh, collect the material and, you know, and do whatever you want with it. Um, when we're in our last location in the U.S., that we moved out of 17 plus years ago, we actually had some composting toilets that dried the material. And then you could take this dry powder and put it in the garden anywhere you wanted it to, to use it. And it, you know, it can be very rich with nutrients. So that, that's a perfectly valid way to do it. But I mean, coming back around to your earlier question, um, instead of using uh, manure, we, we, we we use compost, we make compost, but we also with swales, instead of going to the trouble of making compost, there's some work involved. We just put organic material directly into the swales. So for instance, we, as I mentioned, we have a field, we have several places where we have grass, 
we don't have a lot of grass. Grass isn't particularly great for the environment. I mean, it's not bad, but it's not producing oxygen. At, sure. it's, you know, it's produce, let me say it this way. It's produce, producing oxygen at a fraction of the rate that a tree does. Hmm. Um, a large tree like a mango tree, if you look at the surface area of that tree, it's something like uh, three acres. Wow. So if you look at the grass, uh, you know, under the tree, it's a fra it's going to produce this fraction, a fraction as much. So, okay. right. So we, but we have, but we have some grassy areas on purpose, and we'll take grass clippings and leaves and branches and fruit peels, um, any of these kinds of materials. Even you know, we use recycled paper. Uh, all those things can be can go right into the swales, break down, and feed the soil without a, or having to put a lot of work into it. So it's, it's, a, it's a great technique. Um, nice. Yeah, and, but yes, I mean, get, having, having the, creating the nutrient, the rich nutrients that we want in the soil isn't that difficult with permaculture techniques, even without needing to use uh, manure. Cool. Uh, looks like Wanda has quite a few questions here. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I, how, how long do you have? Do you, do you have a, a time that you need to log off? Yeah, uh, today is Monday, right? I've got this thing on Friday. <laughs> okay. All right, I think I'm, we can be- I'm good, I'm good for a while. I've got, I think I've got a, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good for like another hour. Okay, all right, sounds good. Um, yeah, just looking at the questions here, <laughs> Wanda uh, is asking what you think about uh, eating bugs. What do I she, think about eating bugs? She says, "Why are people Why are people now talking about eating bugs?" Uh, I wonder why people talk about a lot of the things that they talk about. Um, I I don't know, Wanda. I mean, I guess you know. First of all, I think I think that people still believe, as we've all been brainwashed to believe, that we have to figure out how to get enough protein. And the truth is that if, you know, if we really want to live as long and be as healthy as possible, we want to figure out how to not get too much protein. So bugs, which are pretty high in protein, are something I have any interest in. Um, I suppose I might think about eating bugs when I have zero mangoes, papayas, bananas, pineapples, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that ain't going to happen. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I don't think it's I, for me, it is different. I mean, I can see that ants, for instance, I mentioned ants earlier. Ants are interesting and I, I don't know enough about, uh, I'm not an entomologist. I don't know so much about other insects, mm -hmm. but ants apparently don't have individual consciousness, each ant. Mm -hmm. um, ants, it's kind of, it's, it's the hive mentality. Uh, bees are the same. They're thinking about what's best for the hive, for the species, not for the individual. And so I think, you know, perhaps one could say eating these insects is different. You know, I don't know if they've got the same level of consciousness as a cow or a pig or a chicken does. Um, that's one question. The other question is, you know, are, do they appeal to you in any way? Is there anything, are they attractive? I mean, I, I don't eat anything that doesn't look, smell, and taste good to me. Yeah. Why, why would I? Good question. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and also, you know, from what I hear, bugs, you know, from anybody out there that's considering eating bugs, uh, apparently they're, they're very uh, commonly in, infested with parasites. So, you know, another reason to maybe second guess that uh, option for your food. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so yeah. So she, I think she also asked, um, sounds like if she's not able to get to Costa Rica, um, what would you suggest as far as a uh, fasting center? Is there anywhere in the U S or what, what option would you recommend for that? I'm pretty sure there's no other fasting center in the entire universe. <laughs> um, there are, uh, two fasting centers that I'm aware of in North America. 
One is True North in California. One is a place I don't remember their name. They're, they're relatively new and relatively inexperienced in uh, Sedona, Arizona. Um, having said that, I mean, there, there really is nothing like Tanglewood. There's no place like Tanglewood. This, this is the reason why in virtually every session, And B, um, we, we have people from all over the world. Our clients have come from 146 or 147 countries so far. And it's in any session right now, I think we have people here from like a dozen different countries. And so, I, I mean, I think, I think you said something about not being able to get to Central America. Because there's wow. planes for most places. Yeah, I, she. I just assumed that's why she was asking. I, she didn't actually say that, but okay, she, I see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, there there are people that don't want to leave the U.S. Uh, for various reasons, I suppose. Uh, so some people are maybe concerned about security. Maybe think they're they're more danger here. Actually, uh, where we live, it's much safer than most North American cities and in terms of crime and, and violent crime, especially. There's very little of it here, so it's. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I think having operated in the U.S. for years, it's far better to be fasting in a place that's warm most of the time. You know, we're, we're tropical, so most of the time it's quite warm here. Today it happens to be a very gray, wet day most of the day. So I've, I've got on more clothing, long sleeves and long pants. Normally I'm in shorts and flip-flops mm -hmm. and short sleeves almost every day of the year. I actually did some research for someone interested in our project. They said, how many days of sunshine are there? And I researched it and it was something like 355 um, per year. So uh, it's, you know, it's, it's really nice being in a place that's warm. It's nice being in a place where the air is clean, where the, the food is all organic, high quality, where we drink our own spring water, which is, you know, comes out of the ground, crystal clear, perfect. Um, but it's honestly, it's more than that. It's, it's about the philosophy. So I, I can't tell you much more about other places. Unfortunately, there are a lot fewer of them than there used to be. Mm. And I'll tell you that just this, I, I don't, I don't know how much time you want to talk about this, Matt, it's up to you. I'm, I can talk about this all day long. Yeah. But um, when, when I learned about fasting, I used fasting to take back my own health 35 years ago, when I began my, my journey, my fasting journey. When I started to learn that there were, because initially, I, you know, I came across Arnold Eret's book, Rational Fasting. He'd been dead for a long time. He wasn't re responding to any of my emails. Um, and so uh, I didn't, you know, there was no internet at the time. We didn't, we didn't have YouTube or Facebook or any of these sorts of things. So I was kind of on my own. I didn't know that places existed. They did. There were actually more than back then. There were at least four or five fasting centers of different sizes in North America. And, and many of them were people who'd had 50 years of experience and, you know, were, I mean, probably knew more in one pinky than I'll know in my entire lifetime. Um, these guys were, you know, were amazing. Mm -hmm. Really the pioneers. I learned a lot from, from them. I had a couple of mentors. Um, but unfortunately, uh, those places are gone now. When, when, I, when I started to realize what was out there, I looked around and what I saw was that most of them were really way too clinical, a lot of place I'd want to spend mm. four to six weeks. Um, you know, it's interesting, there, there are studies that show that if you're in a hospital room in any city anywhere, but you can see a tree through your window, you heal like 20% faster, just being able to see a tree. Yeah. Here, we're completely ensconced in nature. Every, every room has views into gardens or jungle. Um, you know, we're, again, the air is clean. I mean, we're on a state road, which connects two towns. And we still have an average of like one to two cars per hour passing by. Uh, you know, the air is clean. It's quite, it's, it's amazing. So, yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, my, I set out to, to create the best fasting center in the world because I believed it could be a much better experience. And I think we've succeeded and it's an amazing thing. Mm. Yeah. So. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't think of a better place than Costa Rica to do a fast. So I think you, you picked the right spot. Um, looks like uh, Rich, maybe he said, I've been raw and off and on for two years, seriously struggling with neuropathy and constantly exhausted. I find it so hard to do the full cleanse. I don't know what the full cleanse is, but he says, because life keeps happening, I have to work. Okay, I get. I think what he means is to take off enough time to fast properly. Okay. And I think you said his name is Rich. Rich, I, I feel for you, man. I understand it's not easy. Um, we have a lot of clients who are in a similar position. And you, you might be surprised, I mean, by the lengths people will go to when they're truly committed to their health. In fact, I'll just share with you, when people say to me, I can't do that. I mean, so I can't take the time off. I, I don't have the money, whatever it is, I can't. What I'll usually say is, I think what you're telling me is that it's not important enough to you right now. Mm. Because when it is important enough, we figure out how to make it happen. And we, we've had um, three clients that I'm aware of who sold their home to be able to, I mean, not, not that it costs you know, the price of a house, but they didn't have any other assets. And so they sold their home. They probably was able, were able to take that money and get something else and have money to come to us uh, because that was more important. Um, we've had several people sell their car. Um, we've had other people, you know, people go to all kinds of creative lengths to raise the money. Um, so, and for those people who really can't get here, I mean, if you can get here, being in this environment is amazing. I have an incredible team here. You're in a community of like-minded people. On average, we have about 30 people going through the process together. It's an amazing thing. Um, mm. But for people who can't do that, I also guide people through the process remotely and have been doing that now for your, almost 15 years. Um, and we've created a system that's pretty cool. So not only are you part of a daily group call with up to five other people going through the process together with you, so you're learning not just from your own experience, but from other people's experience, you also get a daily email for me to help motivate, inspire, and educate you. You get a daily video from me every day uh, throughout the process. Um, and, and people really enjoy, enjoy this process. In fact, there's a woman you probably know, Matt, or I'm sure who knows you, knows who you are anyway, who had, has fast with me various times. And I used to do, to work with people remotely, it was one-on-one -on -one calls. And I realize sometimes I'm a little slow. It took me a while to figure out that that wasn't the most efficient way to do this. Um, and I was limiting myself to how many people I could help because it just takes longer that way. And so I actually had a client who does some sort of emotional coaching. I think she might be a therapist. But she said to me, she said, uh, she works with women in France. She said, I only work with groups. And she said, if someone insists they want private, I'll work with them privately. I'll put them in the group. And usually it doesn't take long before they realize the group is much better for them. Mm -hmm. And so this woman had worked with me various times individually. And she contacted me and said, I had an accident. I, need, I want to fast right away. Can you take me? And I said, uh, yes, I'd be happy to do that. However, I, I only work with groups and I just don't have time to work with you individually, but I'll put you in a group. I can put you in a group and we can get you started in a couple of days. And she was really disappointed. I, I really wanted to have your personal attention. Um, you know, I've always, that's how we've always done this before. I really don't want to work with the group. And I said, I understand. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm so busy. I really don't have time to do it otherwise. So she reluctantly went into a group. A week later, she said to me, the group is amazing. I love this. Uh, it was, you know, it's so much better because, again, she had camaraderie and she, she was learning from other people, you know, mm -hmm. from what was happening for them as opposed to just what was happening in her own body. Yeah. So, so yeah. Rich, I would, you know, I would say um, take a look and figure out, you know, what really is most important to you. I, I would have gladly, I did walk away from my house when I lost my health. Um, I wound up, in a sense, losing my first house as well. But I didn't care because I wanted my health back. And that mm -hmm. was more important. And so, you know, you, you, can, you can probably 
uh, will almost certainly take your health to an amazing new level. But it's probably going to require, you know, some time in order for your body to do the cleansing and healing it needs to do. It's well worth it. And you'll be glad you did it, even though it might mean short term things are going to be a little bit more challenging. Right. Yeah. Um, so I guess it, her name, it was Ray, I think Raya, maybe. Um, yeah, she corrected me on her name there. Um, so yeah, it, it sounds like she says that um, it, it is important to her, but it, she just can't, she says she needs to work to, to pay her bills. And um, is, is there any, you know, would there be any uh, suggestions on in the meantime, if she's not able to do it now, what, what would you suggest maybe some steps she could take if there's anything? Yeah, of course, of course, there's many steps. I mean, you know, the key. So, Rhea, you said, um, Rhea, I teach for years, I teach what I call the seven keys to optimal health. Mm. And, and these, you know, most of these aren't new ideas. I mean, it's, it's just how we how we look at and think about this. But basically, what it comes down to is, how well are you meeting all of your body's needs? So the first one, perhaps most important in some ways, and they're all they're all really equally important. But, um, you know, if you're not getting enough sleep, and I, I always I feel like such a hypocrite talking about this because it's been years since I've consistently gotten all the sleep I need. And I think the only reason I continue to be OK and not get sick and still function really well is because my body's clean and because I eat, you know, a really, really clean, simple, high water content diet. But um, the first step would be to make sure you're getting enough sleep every night. You know, the next step would be to make sure you're getting enough, not too much exercise on a consistent basis, because exercise we know is really important for health. But if you do too much, you start to see things go the other way. You just, you know, there's, there's a, there's a sweet spot where you're getting what your body needs, but not too much. Um, you want to make sure you're drinking enough water. Most people don't come close to getting enough water. And, and there's, there's been a huge trend over the last four or five years of, um, raw vegans, often, you know, people eating a fruit based diet, as I do, who think that because the fruits, the, the diet they're eating contains a lot of water, they don't need to drink water. Mm. And it's interesting, because for the last 16 or so years here, we've been measuring clients hydration levels. And the most dehydrated people who show up here almost every session are people who've been doing some regular form of dry fasting. Mm. Uh, they, they get dehydrated. They almost never get hydrated again. Um, the next most dehydrated group, as surprising as this is going to sound, are people eating optimally, very close to what I would recommend eating, but not drinking any water. Mm. Be, you know, the, here's the thing. And again, this, this may be hard for people to believe until they've experienced it, but our average client and I'm going to have to guess because we don't measure this. We don't weigh this. You'll understand in a minute when I tell you what I'm talking about. But the average person is probably eliminating between 10 and 15 pounds of old hard material, what people call mm -hmm. mucoid plaque. Again, we don't really have, we don't really want to weigh this stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, mo most people, I mean, uh, just in the last session, we, uh, we, we opened on Saturday. We run sessions here. We opened on Saturday. We closed a 10 week session two weeks earlier. We had a two week break. The last two weeks of the session, we had five or six people here this past session that were that fasted for around 42 days, around six weeks. And one of them was a guy who was around 47. He might have done 35 days, but um, the last two weeks he was here, he had between 11 and 16 bowel movements every day. Wow. Yeah. Uh, moving out a lot of old hard material. We had another guy who did 42 days, a 73 year old. And the last eight days he was here, he had 11 or more bowel movements every day. In fact, they had a flight. Normally our guests come and go on Saturdays. He and his wife were here together. They had a flight very early on Saturday morning. And so they left here on Friday evening around five o'clock. So they could get that it were, were three and a half hours from the big international airport. There's a smaller one closer by, but they were flying out of the big one. 
And so they left here the night before. And by 5 p.m. when they left here, he had already had 20 bowel movements that day. Wow. Um, people eliminate a lot of material. That old material, until you get rid of it, it's sitting in your system like a giant sponge. Mm. When you eat or drink, it's absorbing water. At night, when you lay down and stop eating and drinking for eight, 10 hours, it's drying out again. And so every day it's absorbing water that you never get the benefit of and then drying out and doing the same thing. And so in order to get hydrated, you have to get rid of that stuff until you do. And the only way I know of that actually works is fasting properly for 21 days or more. And when I say properly, you have to get the right amount of water. You have to be resting completely. Um, if you're using your energy to do other things, your body doesn't have enough energy to break the stuff down. If, you're, if you don't fast long enough, there isn't time to make it happen. If you don't drink enough water, you know, you don't keep the stuff hydrated, it's going to get hard and dry again, and it's not going to leave your body. So every session will have one or two people who just don't drink enough water, and they, they wind up leaving here without having eliminated any of this stuff. Hmm. Um, it's interesting. Sometimes that's all we know. Now, I had a guy who, I have a guy who's here now, and he's very knowledgeable about fasting. In fact, he has a documentary coming out on fasting. Mm. He's fasted awesome. many times. He's been around the world and been to various places. And he came here, and he, uh, he fasted 21 days. It's a seven-day refeeding process, typically. By the seventh day, he had had no bowel movements. Seven days of eating, no bowel movements. So most people start eliminating on day four, mm. uh, sometimes on day three, and, and infrequently on day five or six. But this guy was already, I think, eight days in maybe when he had his first bowel movement. Wow. And um, he, he left here, completed his process and left, got on a plane and flew off to somewhere else, a beautiful luxury you know, resort destination, and wrote to me the next day and said, I hate it here. Um, the food sucks compared to what I was getting at Tanglewood. Can I come back? I said, well, you know, we're closed. And I'm, I was in Europe at that point, uh, vacationing with my girlfriend. But I said, we, I've got staff here. You're welcome. They can come back. The nurse is here every day to take your vital signs. I've got staff in the kitchen that will feed you. Yeah, come on back. He's still here. Um, <laughs> He's now spent more time here refeeding than he's been fasting. He is still eliminating. Right now, it's four or five large bowel movements every day, uh, at least half of which is old, hard material. But it took him a long time to get it moving. This is a guy who had a dry fasting practice mm. before. And when we first talked about this, he was like, you know, I agree with a lot of what you say, but I've had a lot of benefits from dry fasting. And I kept saying to him, right, but the, if the old stuff in your body is going to be more hard and more dry, and it's going to take longer to move. And so it took him twice as long to start even having any bowel movements. Yeah. And he, he's, he's now blown away by what's happened. In fact, he, he, um, when I got back just a few days ago, uh, he had left a gift on my desk and said, I can't thank you enough for what you've given me. This last five weeks, it was five weeks at that point, now he's been here more than six, hmm. um, has been truly life-changing. It's been everything I hoped for and more. I'll most certainly be back. Um, you know, again, this is a guy that had a lot of fasting experience before. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's how, how we do the process that makes a difference. And we see this all the time. Uh, the, a lot of our guests have fasted before. They virtually always tell us the same thing, which is that this was way more powerful here than what they ever experienced before. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm, you know, you're, I'm sure you've got a, um, a protocol that you put them on, but I, I can imagine just being in that environment is, you know, a huge benefit to, to fasting anywhere in the U.S., you know. So just having that, you know, I'm sure it just calms the nervous system, allows you to really go into that sympathetic state and just allow your body to, to heal as, as much as possible during the fast. So, yeah. Absolutely. I, it, you know, I, I truly believe it makes all the difference in the world. In fact, it's, it's interesting because uh, I'll just tell you one more very quick story. We had a woman who arrived here on Saturday and 
I had gone out to run some errands uh, on Saturday afternoon. I got back myself on Friday evening, and so I still had some things I wanted to get done before everyone showed up. And I went on and said, most of our guests usually come on a shuttle from the big airport and don't get here until 7.30 in the evening. So I, I came back sometime mid-afternoon, and she had just gotten here, and she was upset because she couldn't get online. She had a phone, you know, she, I guess her carrier, you know, has some reciprocity here in Costa Rica, but not where we are. There's only one carrier in Costa Rica that provides service and her carrier doesn't work with that one. Mm. Uh, almost none of them do. Um, Cause it's not one of the big companies. It's a national company. Okay. Anyway, she was kind of upset and uh, you know, I thought, you know, this, this is going to be a bit difficult. Um, and the next day next morning when i saw her i said how are you doing she's like i'm doing amazingly well she was like a different person and she said you know it just it just took me like an hour or two I, she went for a walk after i ran into her she was she was leaving as i was coming in and she said i came back and i just sort of chilled for a while and she said the the energy here i mean it was like it transformed her from being really angry and upset to feeling really good and at peace. And she's now having an amazing time. She, you know, this is their second day here. She's now been here two full days. Um, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing what happens. And I, you know, it's, it's being in the energy of nature. I mean, we, we should be vibrating at the same frequency as nature. And most people aren't vibrating even close to that frequency. Right. Yeah, I, I can imagine. Um, yeah, so let's see. Um, is there anything else you would like to share about either Tanglewood or, or upcoming projects that you're, you know, working on? And also, I, I was going to ask you before, um, are people able to, are you taking like volunteers or anything like that to help with your projects that you're working on? Yeah, well, so we're, we're we take volunteers here at Tanglewood. Um, at Las Cascadas, the big project, we're not quite there yet, ready okay. for that. It's, at some point, we will we will take volunteers in different capacities. You know, again, we have we'll have this large uh, organic permaculture based farm. We'll probably have a setup. I mean, those people might be camping out. We might have very simple structures. I'm not sure yet, but we're not quite there yet. I'll, I'll be meeting with an investor hopefully in the next couple of weeks, and that may allow us to move things along quite a bit. I mean, what, what's happened is I've been working on this project now for about nine years, about nine years ago, I started negotiating for the, the big piece of land, the first piece that had the two highest waterfalls in Central America on it. It took me years to get them to agree to, uh, you know, to, to a deal. Hmm. And then we wound up, we now have contracts that we've either executed already or are waiting to execute when we have funds um, with uh, for let's say maybe 20 additional farms all contiguous land. So we've, we've assembled this big piece. It's been a lot of work mm. and I've invested everything I had. So uh, we're now, you know, we're now needing to bring some funds. And so I, you know, I can say for anybody interested in supporting this kind of project, um, there, there could be, there will be some very attractive returns down the road. Cause we've got, I mean, we firmly believe we're going to wind up being one of the top five most visited tourist destinations in Costa Rica. And what's cool about this is we're, we have a large piece of land where the two communities will be. We have two streams on that piece of land. We have waterfall on that piece of land. Um, you know, if someone works from home, uh, let's say, you know, they, they work on their, their laptop or maybe they don't need to work. They sell their home or their business and they don't need to do anything or, uh, you know, whatever it might be, they don't ever have to leave the community if they don't want to. Across the street, we'll have, I mean, and I'm, I'm talking about, you know, maybe a hundred plus acres over here. And then on this side, we have a lot more than that. So mm -hmm. they'll, you know, they'll, they'll be walled and protected and separated. And we can live in the community and, and never be affected by what's going on. But across the street, we'll have the nature preserve and the little commercial village where any community member will be able to run a business that caters to tourists. So there'll be a number of eateries, all of which will be organic raw vegan. There'll be, again, art galleries and shops and boutiques and 
and you could come run any type of business you wanted to that would be interesting to tourists. But because mm. we have the two highest waterfalls in Central America and 18 more waterfalls in the nature preserve, we're going to have this amazing uh, permaculture-based farm with tours and people can see what we're growing. I mean, imagine how many, how many types of mangoes do you know, Matt? Oh, gosh. Personally, I don't. Maybe five. Okay. Uh, you may be aware of this already, but there's more than 3,000 varieties on the planet. I've, I've heard something like that, yeah. Yeah, our goal is to, you know, to acquire as many of them as possible. And, and I mean, let's say we only have 50. We could have a pretty killer mango festival in Mango yeah. City. Um, you know, we already have some, I think, eight or 10 members of the jackfruit family here. We've got about a dozen varieties of durian uh, planted here. Um, you know, so there, there can be amazing things going on when, once, yeah. w once we're bearing fruit with all these, these plants. But um, we, we think people are going to come to see the fruit. They're going to come to see the waterfalls. They're going to come see the botanical garden. They're going to come see the whole thing, which doesn't mm -hmm. exist anywhere in the world like this. And at that point, there'll be tons of opportunities for volunteers. Here at Tanglewood, we do take volunteers, actually depend on them. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just that, I mean, we could probably hire locals to do most of the things that volunteers do. In fact, it would be less expensive than housing and feeding people because, uh, you know, the, the, we, we pay fair wages here, but wages are relatively low and I don't have to house and feed everyone. So, uh, but the community of volunteers is kind of my community. It's, you know, it's, they're, they're, they're my people here. So um, we have those people. We ask them, we, we, we take people, we take volunteers from among clients who have spent at least four weeks with us as a client, fasting 21 days or longer. Mm -hmm. And we have a large group of those people. We always have people that wanna volunteer, but if you're interested, um, you know, the first step would be you can reach out and tell me you're interested. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and register for a fast. Come do that. We don't make commitments to you until we know you, until we spend time with you. So mm -hmm. I'll tell people, yeah, you know, I think there's a good chance. Now, obviously, why I get requests all the time from people we already know. We have a woman here right now fasting, I think, for the fifth time with us. We have a guy who's here for the second time. His brother, his twin brother has been here twice before, mm -hmm. never at the same time. We have... Um, Another woman who's here for the third time. We have, uh, I'm trying to think who else. We have a couple others like that. So, um, you know, the, the people come back and they refer other people and they often, they, they, we know, yeah, when they say to me, I'd like to stick around, we already know them well enough. I'll say, yeah, sure, no problem. But for anybody that we don't know yet, you know, we'll say, come, come hang out with us, come do the prep fast. Um, while you're here, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see how it feels. Because again, I'm living with these people, right? Um, we're not going to accept someone if it doesn't feel good to be around them. Right. But, but there, there's definitely opportunities, and it's an amazing thing to be here. It's, it's crazy. You know, most of the time, when we started this, well, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I mean, the very first thing, time it even occurred to me, we were in our first location, and I got an email from a young Irish woman, and she said, do you take interns? And I thought, that sounds like free labor. <laughs> and I said, yes, of course, absolutely. She was the first one. Um, and we had, we had a whole organized internship program for about 12 years. It took so much of my time, we stopped doing that. Yeah. Uh, and so what we do now, is, it's a little different than that. But it's, it's similar in many ways. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's really, I think it's worked out to be a great thing. And there's opportunities. But I, you know, originally, I thought, you know, people will be here for three months, six months. I have a guy who's been here for eight plus years. Mm. I have a woman who is, she just told me she's leaving. Um, I love her. She's, she first came to fast six and a half years ago. And she was married at the time in the U.S., went home, subsequently got divorced, uh, came back a year and a half or two years after her first fast, so more than four years ago, and has been here ever since. Um, we had another woman who was here for about three years, uh, another one who was here for a couple of years. Um, and I've got now, I've got people that have been here for, you know, for a year or so um, in addition. But, you know, it's, I mean, if it feels good and it's a great fit, you could stay here as long as you like. 
uh, it's fine. Um, and there's going to be huge opportunities as we start moving forward with, with more of the big development because there's, I mean, what's going to happen there is going to be incredible. Yeah, it sounds absolutely amazing. Um, I, I'm really excited to watch that continue to unfold for you down there. That's, that's incredible. Um, yeah, so anybody out there, so would they want to go to tanglewoodwellnesscenter.com or where would they go if they want to support this project of yours? Well, uh, for, for the other project, we have a website. It's lostcascadas.org because the, the land will be owned by a nonprofit. I say will be because at the time I, I bought the land that we've bought so far, the 501c3 hadn't been set up yet. So I okay. bought it in my own name. It will be transferred to the 501c3. Again, with the exception of the land where the communities will be, which will be owned almost like a condominium. They call it a green condominium. So you own your lot, I own mine. We each have a share of the common land, mm. um, you know, a percentage of that. And so, um, yeah, so .org because it will be owned by a nonprofit. So lascascadas.org, you can go there. Um, you, you're probably aware I started uh, two years ago now, something called, almost, something called the Academy for Vibrant Living. Yep. We, we, have, uh, we have two courses if you complete, the first one is called Vibrant Health, and that's just for yourself, you know, if you want to feel and function better than ever. Uh, I had, you know, I, I, I created a program 20 plus years ago called the Creating Perfect Health System, which we still offer. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually just about to get a little bit of a marketing boost. But I, I had people asking me all the time for something more comprehensive, because that was not, you know, not a super comprehensive program. It's a $300 program. There's like 16 hours of live material, but they wanted much more than that. Mm. And so uh, after, I don't know if you've heard of COVID, after that COVID happened. Sounds familiar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the borders were closed in Costa Rica for six months. I had a little bit of free time on my hands. So yeah. I said, this would be a good time to build this. I've been trying to figure out how to make this happen for years we went ahead and put the energy and resources into creating this program. And um, we've had amazing feedback from it. We have two courses. The first one, as I said, is about your personal health. The second one is uh, called Health Coach. And when you complete, but you have to complete the first one to take the health coaching course. There are places you can go, by the way, in two or three months, you can become a health coach. But I don't understand how someone can be a health coach without already having an amazing level of health themselves. So we want to help everyone, you know, first, first of all, experience an amazing level of health in their own body, and then they can take what they've learned and we teach them how to run a successful business and all that. Um, that when you complete that course, you actually get an outside certification from a, a North American board that certifies people to, to be coaches. And so um, that's pretty cool. And that's um, the Academy for Vibrant Living dot com. And then if you're interested in Tanglewood, it's the tanglewoodwellnesscenter.com. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, well, uh, I appreciate all this time that you've uh, spent with us and, and the wisdom that you've shared. Um, I would certainly love to have you back on and, and, you know, get more into, I'm sure tons of people have, you know, questions about fasting and uh, sure. Forces and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, in the future, I would love to have you back on and, and do this again and get into some of those things as well. I'd be happy to do it, Matt. Just let me know when. We'll, we'll make it happen. Okay. Perfect. By, by the way, just one more quick thing I'll mention. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'd feel remiss if I didn't. Uh, it, I don't know if, if your followers are probably all over the world, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, I know mine are too. Um, I just came back from. Uh, Montenegro and Croatia. And mm -hmm. I'm headed back that way in just a month. Um, Marina Grubic, who you may know. Yeah. Uh, Marina has organized events for me over the last eight or nine years in Serbia, including about three months ago. And she's, she's a client. She fasted with me not that long ago. And she asked me whether I would come to speak at a festival in Montenegro, where I just, it was actually I think the the event's going to be about uh, five, six miles from where I just spent the last week or so. Um, yeah. So that's happening from October 6th through 9th. Should be a lot of fun. I'll be there speaking. 
each day, uh, the seventh, eighth, and ninth. Um, it should be good. And I, if you'd like, I can get you a link. Actually, on Instagram, you can't post links anyway, can you? Right. I don't. Yeah, I don't think they work. Um, do you do you have a a link tree on your account on your your page? I I, I don't. I, you know, I didn't know what that was until today. I'm oh. I'm a bit of a dinosaur. Um, you probably you probably already know this, but I'm 29 years old. And I just... <laughs> yeah, I I was thinking you were somewhere around there. So, right, yeah. right. Uh, I you know it sounds like a cool thing. I guess in your in your bio you can put the link tree address and then you can have all your links there. Yeah, it works really well. And it's, I'm it's gonna pretty... figure out how to do that. So, yeah, I'd look into that. I will. Cool. Well, in the meantime, in the meantime, you can probably find it online now. Marina's got the page up in English and Serbian. It's okay. the Adriatic Fruit Festival. Terrific. So, All right. Hope to Great. see you there. Yeah, definitely. That would be terrific. All right. Well, hey, uh, again, I really appreciate it. No, it's uh, a pleasure. Yeah, I, I so respect everything that you do and the time and effort you put into helping people improve their lives and, you know, take control of their health again. So thanks for thanks for doing and that. It, it's, it's a pleasure. And by the way, I mean, I, I, I very much respect what you're up to as well. I see that you're out there having some significant impact. And that's awesome. I think oh, there's there's lots of room. Um, my, my guess is if we if we looked at the details, there might be, you know, a few places you and I disagree about things. That's okay. Yeah, that's, that's no problem. You know, I think um, the, the basic philosophy is the same. I think we have a similar understanding of those most important aspects. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think there's people are going to have to make their own choices about some of the details, but the key is to be pointed in this direction because this is what works. And I know you're out there helping a lot of people. So I'm really glad to be here and help support what you're up to. I appreciate that. Thank you so yeah. much. My pleasure. All right. Well, I will, uh, I'll talk to you again soon and thank you everybody for joining this live and, and you know, interacting with us and showing your support. So again, go check out all of the resources that Lauren mentioned. Um, if you have any questions about any of that, I'm sure just send you a DM or sure. website. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Be glad to. All right. Terrific. Take care everybody. Bye -bye. Yeah. Thank you. Have a great night.